I'm doing the number one no-no of ministry. Is that one of the things I always wanted to do was to make people realize that in Israel, we like to sit around at tables during Shabbos, during Friday night, at of Shabbat, and uh, eat, of course, usually some matzah soup and then lots of other food. But at the same time, the whole idea of eating was of communion and fellowship and to be able to discuss things and to be able to share what you're thinking about. So you would naturally have to have food and you'd be discussing it while you were chewing. So, I wanted to do the same once in a while to bring out the whole idea that God wants to sit down and have food with you. He wants to sit down and communicate. Not just, not just when you're ready, but when you're unexpectedly not expecting God to speak. And you could imagine some of those places. But, you see, God sees it all. So, I think a lot of times what we do is we get our perspective messed up because we try to put God as distant instead of personal. We try to make God like us rather than recognize He is greater than we are. And so, sometimes, you know, I may, I don't know, have some fruit here or some meat or maybe a Pepsi. <laughs> And just do as what used to be done in the old days, in the old ways, where if you wanted to talk about God and you wanted to share the things and you shared with food and you communicated and you used your hands and you discussed it and you had fun and you enjoyed it and it was a reality because a lot of times, you know, a little wine will calm people's nerves. Now, I'll admit in this culture, meaning the American culture, maybe that's not a good idea. <laughs> I know there are too many people that tend to have these outrageous problems with alcohol and well all the addictions it doesn't matter what it is whether it be alcohol or whether it be sexual addictions or pornography or sugar or diet or health or wealth or whatever or we could even say that there's people with holy spirit addiction that they run around with holy spirit this and holy spirit that and holy spirit everywhere <laughs> so anything that you get obsessed with it could become an addiction if your mind makes that connection i mean but Overseas, you know, like when I was in Israel and I lived there, oh, it was relaxing. Well, it was intense, <laughs> I should say. It wasn't so relaxing, maybe on Shabbat, but it was intense in the sense of the conversations and the joy of being able to just share together, you know, and whether it be with wine or whether it be with, you know, when I was in Chabad as a, working with them, they had Crown Royal, so that was, that was definitely alcohol. <laughs> but... There was a maturity about it that no one ever would have imagined someone getting smashed or drunk or being belligerent or being, you know, influenced to the point of being, I don't know, you know, being, having an attitude. But it was more of a relaxation. And it's too bad that that's not part of our culture, that we can't get to that. Because I think, in reality, if we sat down with food, you know, and drink and conversation with God, then maybe our understanding of Him would go a lot farther than what it is now. A lot of times we get so distant and so processed that I think we miss the point of what God is saying. It speaks to my heart, God, when a day of adversity comes, what is your Goliath? My Goliath right now is this big old smear on my glasses because I have a tendency of not cleaning glasses so we'll just be just as normal as I said I always wanted these to be that this should be a time of reality and not exclusivity by being oh so holy or oh so distant or I'm anointed and you're appointed <laughs> no God is in control so maybe we can see better now and more clearly even as the message says when adversity comes we need to see clear in order to know the way we should go do you like the way i worked that in that's god <laughs> not me 
What is your Goliath? Are you in a battle, a conflict, a hard place? Is something or someone threatening your peace, your security? Does a Goliath loom before you? Do you seem so small, so significant, insignificant, so impotent in comparison? If so, you are looking in the wrong place. Look up. Look up to the heavens. Look up to your Father's throne. Look up to your High Priest standing at the right hand of the Father on your behalf. Then look within. Is the Spirit of the Living God not dwelling within you? Is He not your resident helper, your on-call comforter? Has He not offered you His joy, His love, His peace, His patience, His kindness, His goodness, His faithfulness, His gentleness, and His self-control? Nothing has changed. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit still rule. They are still God. So say to that Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. 1 Samuel 17:45. God has given you his name, his name which reveals his character and his ways. That's where you are to look. See who God is compared to what you think you're facing. Look at who God is and what God is. When God, when David faced Goliath, he remembered that God was Jehovah Shabaoth, Sabaoth the Lord of hosts, which means he's a captain of all principalities, all powers, and all spiritual forces in high places. Every angelic being, good and evil, are under his control. The power and authority belong to God, not to angels or to you or to me. Now, remember that, because this is where people, I think, get the mistaking idea about Satan or about God or about demons or demon possession or anything else god is in control satan is not a free agent doing his own thing because god can't stop him or god's like suddenly taking a back seat or step back and he's waiting for you to do something no no not at all god is in control of all things that's why he is the lord of hosts he is the god of all he is that he is and he will reveal himself as he chooses to reveal himself to his people and so don't mistake just an angelic being that's fallen like satan as having some great godlike power he doesn't he's just an angel that's all he was a covering angel so what you have the son of god you have the Holy Spirit, and you have God the Father. Do you think having God compares to having an angel that was created? Huh. You'll laugh. And that's what we're told we will do one day. When we see Satan as he is, we will laugh. What is your Goliath? Call upon Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner. Run to his camp. Stand under his banner and call upon the captain of the hosts. Can God handle your Goliath? Of course. David brought Goliath down with a single stone of faith. Stop and think about it. The other Israelites had the same God, and the same God was on their side that David had. Then what was the difference? The difference was David trusted in what he knew about God. Saul, Israel's king, tried to dress David in his armor to equip him with his sword, and Saul was trusting in the arm of his own flesh, his own abilities, not in the Lord his God. David knew that the weapons of his warfare were not fleshy, but mighty through God. Beloved, don't you see? God in his sovereignty permits Goliath in your lives as tests. There are circumstances and situations that are bigger than you are. Tests which will give you an opportunity to prove your faith, to prove who you turn to, to show where your heart is at. And in proving your faith, you prove him, meaning you prove you are his child and that you turn to your father in heaven. And thus, you are strengthened. David had been strengthened by his previous encounters with lions and bears and tigers. Oh my. <laughs> God had delivered him back then. He could do it again. The lions and bears were just preparation for Goliath. Have you not seen in your own life circumstances have prepared you for the moment that you're in right now? Then what are you worried about? <laughs> Take it to the Lord. You'll never be the Christian you can be without Goliath. You have to be tried and tested. You have to learn and grow. You have to develop the strengths by passing through them. 
You'll never know God intimately apart from Him. It's the trials, the conflicts, the adversities, the no way out of situations, the impossibilities that drive us to God. Where we discover who He is and what He is and just how much He really does love you. Not to run to Him means to miss knowing Him and it means miss experiencing His power, His glory, His majesty, and His sufficiency for all that you are. When the king of Aram surrounded the city where the prophet Elisha was staying, or Elisha was staying, the king was furious because Elisha had kept revealing his battle plans to the king of Israel. So he sent horses and chariots and a great army to get the one man, Elijah or Elisha. And when Elisha servant saw the army encircling the city, he cried out to the prophet, Master, what are we going to do? Look out. We're surrounded. <laughs> Where's the cavalry? Do not fear, said Elisha, for those who are with us are more than those who are against us. 2 Kings 6.16 Then Elisha, or Elisha, prayed for his servant, O oh Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw him. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah, Elisha, 2 Kings 6.17. The Lord of hosts, Jehovah Nishabaroth, was there all the time. The king of Aram, army, was struck blind. I pray that our El Roy, or El Roy, <laughs> it's funny when you try to get back to... Uh, Phonetics, which is what Hebrew is, phonetically written, not our English way of messing everything up <laughs> and then making excuses for it. Oh, I mean exceptions. Um, <laughs> it's hard to say it sometimes because you, you forget how to go back to a different language that you might know. But El, Roy, the God who sees, will open your eyes that you might see that there is there with his very real but unseen host to move on your behalf. I pray that you'll begin to meet every Goliath in that confidence. I pray that you'll get to know your God by name, and that in the day of adversity, you'll not hesitate to call upon the name of the Lord, so you will be saved. And that you'll not hesitate to run to Him and be secure. And that you'll not worry to do your own thing, but that you'll find that His thing is for you to seek Him. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots, because they are many and in horsemen, because they are strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor do they seek the Lord. Isaiah 31 1. Seek Him. Look to Him. Cling to His truth. You will not be disappointed. The Lord also will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 9, 9 through 10. Does it get any more blunt than that? <laughs> I don't think so. No offense to you, but you know, when I'm facing a Goliath, I'm not scrounging around on the ground for some stones. I'm going immediately to the rock of my salvation because <laughs> he could throw it better than I can. How about you? <laughs> I hope you do. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.